Hey, Legend. Welcome to the Noob Spirit Podcast. If this is your very first time, you're in for an absolute treat. It is a father-daughter combo today. Uh, an avid, very well-regarded marine biologist in Marcus Lincoln-Smith, and his daughter, Emma Lincoln-Smith, is an ex, well, retired winter Olympian, a former skeleton racer. Uh, both of these guys are avid Spiros, very knowledgeable, very thoughtful people. And Emma has a new project called Ocean Rangers Apparel, which we talk about. I love seeing people do new stuff in our spearing world. So we're going to explore that a bit today and, and hear a little bit about their lives and also some of the research that Marcus has done and um, dialing in on some of their favorite species to hunt as well as their tips to hunt them. So I hope you enjoyed today's episode. Again, something different, a father-daughter combo. But every week I'm interviewing spearing legends from around the planet, just people who froth on the spearfishing lifestyle. And there's always nuggets in these things. So thanks for tuning in uh, and subscribing. Absolutely love it. A couple of things on the spearing calendar. I'm getting ready for the WA Spearfishing Nationals. And in order to prepare myself physically better than I have in the past, I'm putting together, or I have put together, a 50-day spearfishing program. It's called Spear Ready, which will help you to be as prepared as you can be to make the most of a trip of a lifetime. So if you want to do it, we've already kicked off. We started on the 1st of March, but if you are interested in doing it, go to noobspero.com forward slash spear ready. Still looking for people to help give us feedback uh, because this is absolutely the first round of this thing. I am one of the crash test dummies as well as Tom because him and I are going to compete in the WA Nationals together. Absolutely looking forward to it. If you want to come and test out this program with us, go to noobspero.com forward slash spear ready and um, sign up. We'd love to hear what you think. Uh, also, guys, coming up in the next few weeks, it's the Panama Spearfishing Zoom call Q&A with the local guide, Robert Schmaus. If you listened to last week's interview, you might have an idea who Robert is. But on the 13th of March at 8 p.m. Brisbane time, and like if you're in New Zealand, it'll be 11 p.m., which might be a bit late. Californians, it'll be 3 a.m., which is way too early. But if you're in Florida, it's 6 a.m., uh, and if you're in Australia, it's probably doable on, an, on, a, on a weekday night. But come and find out about going spearfishing in an absolutely epic location. And Robert has got all the ins and outs. He's got a couple of sort of modalities for planning these trips. And he is a full-on expert frother in that part of the world. And he is obsessed with it himself. Lots of different options. And so I'd encourage you to join us on the Zoom call. Go to noobspero.com forward slash Panama to register. If you can't make the live call, then I can send you out a recording of it after. Again, that's noobspero.com forward slash Panama. Hey, let's get into today's episode with Emma and Marcus Lincoln-Smith. Here we go. Danny says, Adreno, you guys are ahead of the game. Price is very competitive. Customer service is fantastic. Speed of delivery from your warehouse is the best I've ever experienced. And everything I have purchased was in stock. Great experience. Highly recommend these guys for anything to do with what happens and what you need to get under the water. That review from Danny. Check him out at adreno.com.au. These guys do a fantastic job outfitting Noob Spiros from all over particularly Australia, but check them out at adreno.com.au. You can save $20 on every purchase over $200. Not only can you use it online, but you can also use it in-store. They've got two stores in Brisbane. They've got Gold Coast, Sydney, Melbourne, Perth. Check them out. They are doing good things. Adreno.com.au. Are you US-based looking for free diving, spearfishing gear? Neptonics is the best. Their online website so easy to use. If you've got any questions, Jerry and the team answer questions via phone, email. Anyway, they've got an easy contact form on the site. Uh, these guys are absolute legends. And uh, if they sell it, they believe in it, they back it, they use it themselves. It's tough gear that works. Visit neptonics.com. Use the code NOOB10 to save 10% on any order at neptonics.com. That's right. Use the code NOOB10, N-O-O-B-10 on your next order. Save 10% at neptonics.com. In a world of cancel culture, we need to be bold and stand up. Ignore the self-censorship, have a laugh and poke the bear, or in this case a shark, to fuck the tax man. Listeners get a free hat of their choice when they spend over $100 at noobsparrow.com forward slash taxman when they use the code at noobsparrow with designs that capture the frustration of having your fish taxed. You'll love the FTTM long sleeve UV blocking fishing jerseys, t-shirts, hats and more. Visit noobspero.com forward slash taxman. Use the code noobspero to score a free hat of your choice when you spend $100 or more. 
Again, go to noobspirit.com forward slash taxman. Uh, g'day, guys. We're, uh, I'm, I'm joined by two legends today. It's a father-daughter combo, which is an interesting one for the podcast, and maybe a first. Uh, it's Marcus and Emma Lincoln-Smith. Uh, Emma has recently founded uh, an apparel company that celebrates her love for spearfishing. It's called Ocean Rangers, and uh, both of these two love their spearfishing. Marcus is a marine biologist. Is that right, Marcus? Or Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And absolute... Sydney Spiro Frothers, by the sounds of it, is that have I got that right? <laughs> we try. True. Yeah. yeah, Emma, you said like um, you guys have both had sort of very interesting lives, I think. But one thing you said was like you always return to the ocean as a sort of a sense of um, like uh, regrowth about it. I think was what you said, or something similar. Did I? Um, yeah. Walk me through yeah. That? So I guess I've always had a pretty. Um, high flying life with my sport and um and then my my new job which I've been in for the last two years I'm a firefighter and um you know it's a pretty stressful environment and um you see some pretty heavy things and just to be able to go back to the ocean and just keep it really simple and you know even if you don't you know go and shoot a fish and and get your dinner just being in that environment for me is just it just centers me and just keeps me really calm and, and, you know, simplifies things. And it's just my home pretty much. It's, um, I need it. <laughs> yeah. Love it. You, you, you believe it or not, you're the fifth, um, Spiro firefighter I've chatted oh, to on the podcast. Cause we have, we have a few days off in between shifts. So it's, yeah. it's nice to have lots of hobbies. I think a lot of, <laughs> Ex-military people, emergency yeah. services people are definitely attracted to probably the physiological benefits of spearfishing as much as the the the, the physical well-being aspects to it too, because it is a part a place that's not really people-centered, and uh, it's cool to be invi- immersed in an environment. I think where you can shake some of that stuff off. Would that be sort of fair? Exactly. Yeah, and you just get away from it, and you can just you know, as you say, be on your own, and you don't have to be around people and. I used to be much more into surfing, but it's just so busy trying mm. to get waves now, especially at Narrabeen. And so just going for a dive, it's just, it's, yeah, being on your own, just being in the ocean, it's it's nice. I need it after those big shifts. Mm. And Marcus, marine biology, you've been doing it. I, I think I read one of your papers that was cited from 1989 or something. You've been doing it a little while. Yeah, I, um, I, um, Went to uni, did honours, looking at artificial reefs. Then I had a had a job with the New South Wales Fisheries uh, at, as um, a temp. Um, I didn't have a full time job, but I stayed there for about two years. Um, and during that time, I learnt so many things from the guys that that I was with. Um, worked on projects in Botany Bay. Um, worked with a, a very famous um, guy called. David Pollard, and we looked at marine reserves and artificial reef issues. Um, then I went back to uni, did a master's on artificial reefs and um, looking at methods for surveying reef fish, you know, using scuba pro, um, scuba equipment. Mm. And, yeah, and then it's just gone on from there. So I started my own business, and I've been running that since 1985. Uh, wow. But I'm I'm pulling back a little bit. I'm not as not getting as much um, things done now because I just prefer to relax and do some other things, you know, like go diving and <laughs> and uh, watch my daughters' um, amazing achievements. Yeah, you brought up a a, a a bunch of talented daughters, as I understand yeah. it. Oh, you got yeah. the two Absolutely. two two Olympians. I think they were the two sisters. Uh, in the summer and winter games, respectively. So that's pretty. That's pretty amazing to raise some strong women like that. I think so. It says yeah. It speaks volumes oh yeah, they're it. they're very strong. And um, uh, Vicky, my wife and I, we were we were sort of sports groupies for over ten years, traipsing around the world, either in the snow or somewhere around a swimming pool, watching yeah, them so. compete. Um, some of the best times of our lives, getting to travel and. And seeing you know, all of the amazing things that they were doing, even when they weren't winning, it was still you know an amazing yeah. experience. Yeah, yeah. The experiences are everything. So Emma, as I understand it, you're a skeleton racer. Holly's a a, a water polo player. 
Um, between the two of you, Jeepers, there must have been some some hectic fights when you were teenage girls. Yeah, yeah. Sure was. We used to practice uh, WWF, you know, yeah. when, <laughs> when we were kids and I always won. So just uh, <laughs> when, Holly, when Holly hears this, she can, she'll, you know, she'll probably want to punch me. But anyway, um, I, I didn't know. I didn't know what skeleton racing was. I jumped on and I I saw your video in the Atlantic Olympics, I think. It was 2010 maybe. And I I didn't really know anything about it. So 5G is what you're exposed to, head first going down like a luge type bobsled style track and you're you're head first and it's just you and it's a sprint start. I was like dumbfounded. I was like, this is freaking crazy. It's pretty stupid to be honest. (laughs) Yeah. But, yeah, so I started doing beach sprinting, so I always had um, really good, you know, I was fast and then got talent selected and just happened to, you know, land myself in this sport. And, and yeah, it's the same track as the bobsledders go down, it's head first on his stomach, you get up to over 140 kilometres and it's it's a pretty amazing feeling. There's not really many sports, I think, that, you know, compare to the speed and just how, how good it feels when you get have a good run um mm. when you have a crash it's not so much fun you know it's um <laughs> it's pretty scary like and it hurts yeah. the ice isn't really smooth it, it hurts it burns mm. um but it also you know when you do have those good good runs it's like diving like when you you know you spend most of the time out there catching nothing or seeing nothing and then yeah. you have those few dives where you just clean up and everything just works you know and it's the same you know you, you just really appreciate those good days um, so and, yeah. is is that something you're addicted to? I, I call it the flow state. It's where, <laughs> yeah. you know, where it all clicks and everything where makes sense clicks. and, and then there's no noise because you're just a hundred percent in the moment. Is that something exactly? That's, yeah. yeah. It's that hesitation. I think in anything that, you know, that stops you from succeeding and the same as spearfishing, if you hesitate or you overthink something, you know, your brain's going to be always your big, your biggest, um, deterrent at the end of the day so you just if you can quieten everything um i just find that you just your body just takes over and you, you know it's, everything becomes easier so mm. and that's sort of how i try and do everything work you know those big fires and all those sorts of things just shut your mind up and just focus you know on doing the little simple things right and everything comes together so wow. yeah Love it. That's, that's an amazing perspective. So, I mean, how long have, have you got? Did you guys start spearfishing together? What did what did it look like? And 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 Marcus, how long have you been spearfishing? Well, I I, I started with a um, with a broom handle and some crab spears that I wrapped around and <laughs> walking around Sydney Harbour, uh, spearing leather jackets basically. Um, yep. and that was from when I was about nine years old. Uh, then I used to I used to do a lot of swimming, so I was always in the water. Actually, down at Watson's Bay Baths, um, and oh, wow. um, and then I kind of progressed to putting on a mask and swimming around with that um, wooden spear, getting leather jackets from the water, and mm-hmm. then just progressed from there. I had a very good friend who um, we kind of taught each other badly, but blind, um, blind leading the blind. It. Yeah, sure. Yep. Um, and we had a little tinny that um, we used to take out. So collecting mussels, um, spearing a few fish, mainly red moong at those days. Yeah. Um, and then it just progressed from there. So um, it's been a long, long love affair for me with the water and with and with spearing. And scuba diving too. I mean, I, I do that for my work and I, I really enjoy that. But you don't have that sense of freedom that you yeah. get free diving. I started with scuba diving. I went, I went through the recreational instruction route when I was a bit younger. Um, no one wanted to hire an eighteen-year-old instructor. Funnily enough, though, um, yeah. Yeah. it was a bit of a, a bit of a gimmick on at the time in New Zealand where I grew up. I think I was eighteen, and the same year I got my instructors. Ten thousand other people in New Zealand got their scuba diving instructors <laughs> license. I think one thousand yeah. people are employed from one end of the country to the other in the industry. So. It was a little bit underhanded, I thought. But having said that, it gave me a lot of confidence as a as a as a young man, and I and I developed an immense appreciation for the underwater world. But I yeah. I I had the hunting orientation from the start, though. Like um, a lot, lot you know, crayfish in New Zealand were just 
Like yeah. it was just, I just endlessly sort of enjoyed doing that. So there's a lot of craze in New Zealand. It's yeah, it's ridiculous. Yeah. <laughs> we just got back last yeah, week. Yeah, I remember and, you saying. Uh, yeah, we didn't unfortunately get to do any spear fishing, but we we went looking for craze and yeah, got some good ones. So. Yeah, pack, pack horse or just your southerns? A couple of pack horses, and then um, we all got a couple of the what were the other ones? Sorry, the, southerns, the southerns, or yeah, yeah, just, yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah. I mean, pack horse are your easterns anyway, and yeah, and your southerns are your southerns, but yeah, 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 cool. yeah. It's a shame you didn't get out to the Three Kings. I've done it once, um, yeah. it's an amazing place, isn't it? Have you guys yeah. been there before, or well, we went that we went there, that's where we went, but we didn't get to dive there, like. Proper spear fishing. We went um, line fishing, so yeah. yeah, it was just a bit rough, unfortunately. But um, and the weather was not very kind. No, and the wa- the water temperature dropped from twenty two degrees the week before to seventeen the week we were there. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. yeah we weren't prepared for that. <laughs> no. You, did you have your three mil suits or did you have five yeah. mil suits? Yeah, oh, three wow. mil suits. <laughs> yeah, she's a bit rugged and like. I don't yeah. know. I, I start I start wimping out under twenty in a in a three yeah. minute suit. To be honest, yeah. it was pretty cold. We had, we were a bit shocked when we first jumped in. Yeah, right. What about you, Emma? How did you start spearing? Did you did you get into it with your dad, or what did that? Look yeah. Like? So obviously, dad got me into it. Um, always, we we um, grew up in the water. Like you know, every weekend was down in the in the ocean, and I used to watch dad bring back you know these big fish, and I'd be like wow like you know just in awe of of the whole process and then he got me a hand spear and took me out and my first fish was a little red moong and you know I was so excited you know shooting it with my little hand spear and then started to learn the species and you know what we could take and what you can't take and the size limits and bag limits and all those sorts of things and Mm. like I really took the time to to know what I could and couldn't take. And mm. so I went out there with a real purpose, like, okay, I really want to catch kingfish and I, or I really want to catch a drum or whatever it was and just slowly, you know, figured out what I wanted to go after and yeah, yep. watching him, you know, like how to hunt and, mm. um, you know, you got to be really patient and just sort of, you know, understand that like you're in their world and you got to, you know, you got to act a certain way around them. They're not just going to present themselves in front of you. Sometimes they do, but like, yeah. So just learning how to be a better hunter um, was quite a challenge. And then over time, I just sort of was able to get out a bit more, especially once I retired from sport. And yeah. then I guess really got into it probably 10 years ago. And I've just been a bit obsessive <laughs> about it, as most spirits are. Like, um, yeah, I'm, I'm, and always to get out like yep. i drive him insane because i'm always like let's take the boat out or let's <laughs> let's go up you know up the coast or something but um how, how, I just love it. how important do you guys think it is for kids to experience the natural world and because me I, I personally think that that's how conservationists are born it's by it's through the active pursuit of being in the environment and experiencing things i think taking life is also a really part of like um especially if it's done in an intentional way, teaching people about responsibility and things like that. What do you guys think? Oh, look, I, I agree. I think um, when I've got two little grandkids now, Emma's um, little niece and nephew, and, um, you know, it's just wonderful just showing them the natural world, not, not really um, overdoing it, just letting them sort of discover things themselves mm. and then give them a guiding hand and as they get older well you know hopefully they'll they'll get more and more interested and um and we can teach them the more and more so um i guess with my biological background i can explain some of the things identify some of the species um and emma's mum my wife um she's a very good drawer so she's draws um you know really good um oh, fish and so forth so it's all it's all part of the family thing and mm. um and yeah it's a real buzz seeing the kids learning and being interested and i hope they never lose it you know i think it's really important like you know every time you take like you mentioned taking a life you know like i don't take it lightly either like when i go out i'm 
I'm very grateful to the fish. Like I, I actually say, like thank you to the fish when I when I've killed it because it's you know you appreciate where your food comes from rather than just going to shop and getting it and going home and you know and people often ask me like oh I don't know how you can kill you know that that fish and it's like well it's I don't take it lightly but you know I'm very grateful and it's a very selective process and you know you catch it you clean it you cook it you you do all the steps and I think Mm. When you understand that that's what it takes to put something in front of you, that it's you really appreciate it, and it's you know there's nothing better than having your own cooked meal that you've caught, cleaned, cooked, oh, all those you know things. Hundred percent relate. I think you know you guys are familiar with anthropomorphism. You know, like you know the Bambi effect, where we where we we people think that maybe nefariously we've put human characteristics onto animals to stop people from wanting to hunt and we've seen the rise of mm. vegan activism and things like this. You know, from a lot of people's perspective, though, there's a hierarchy of animals and the level of relatability we have to them. And a lot of people think that fish are still like relatively, you know, like we don't ascribe personality to them. It's funny, like we get in the water and you spend all this time with them you actually do see that they have personalities. They do, but we, yeah. But, but we, still take, we still take their lives. We just do it with that level of awareness about it. And uh, it, it's kind of weird. Like people think that we're somehow more removed from them because we're killing them, but it's like it's, all, it's almost like the reverse is true. Yeah, yeah, 100%. And like, you know, you I often will be in the water and I'll see a little fish and you sort of, you know, like you almost – having a little moment with them and I and I just find myself waving to them and saying goodbye rather than <laughs> putting them on the end of my spear. Like I like to see them in the water just as much as I like to um, take them home for, for a meal. So you, mm. I think appreciating that environment that you're in rather than just taking from it all the time is yeah. really important. Yeah. That, that, that journey of mastery that you – walk through Emma with like species acquisition. So first you you sort of identified some of the steps that I think about, which is like, you know, IDing it, recognizing what it is and what it looks like in the water, recognizing, you know, what size you want to take and then taking it and working out how to take it, like what, what strategy a hunting approach is going to work best for it or how to arouse its curiosity. And then you, you might get lucky and shoot one and then eventually it becomes a more intentional process and you kind of know what you're doing and you can choose or not choose to take that fish. And yeah. you sort of you walk through this this sort of this journey with it. And I, I always think of spearfishing as, as that journey of mastery. But I think another part of it is, is you learn a lot more about your age of uh, fecundity, like reproduction and things like that. And then you, then you start to do, have, have a, a broader understanding of how it fits in the marine ecosystem and then – you know, yeah. it, it's a funny little journey we go on, I think. It is, so, yeah, and that's something Dad's been really good to help me with. Like, you know, we'll, we'll look at a fish or something and he'll be like, oh, that fish is probably 50 years old or, yeah. you know, and you're like, wow, like, you know, that you sort of don't realise these things and then yeah. when you realise that, you, you really appreciate, you know, taking that life. Like that thing's been here for 50, longer than me, you know, and you sort of, you yeah you just sort of have to think about what you're doing a bit more rather than just going and shooting things and mm. you know yeah oh, wow. yeah we did some aging um studies on red molong and found that they live to at least 40 years wow so they're, they're hanging around out there for for quite a long time and um makes you appreciate you know their their environment a lot more they're quite vulnerable to us too if we're yeah. honest as well like oh, yeah. yeah. They're not a particularly smart or elusive species. But when you're starting, I personally think that they're a great target species because you know they're not going to, people aren't going to target them forever. Like, yeah, and uh, sure. you get more and more selective about when and where you take them, I think, as long as you, you know, you don't have a seared conscience or, you know, like, or are deliberately obtuse. Like, I think, mm. um, but there are people like that. I mean, we're, we're, you know, it's got, there's all types. Yeah. I want to ask you some more controversial questions. Bigger questions, Marcus, about fisheries management and stuff. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm hoping to stir up the pot a wee bit, but uh, I'll before, do my best. Before we get there, um, we're talking about this journey of mastery with species, Emma. I, I, I particularly pointed at us in that direction because, like, some of the shirts you've started designing are about celebrating some of the species that you love to take, 
And uh, I noticed two of the ones you've already sort of uh, picked out and you already have up are uh, a tribute to a sort of Mulloway and then also the, the yellowtail kingfish. Talk to me about, first of all, the Mulloway. Why, what, for you, like, what, what's the appeal of them and, and, and why did you want to make a shirt about the Mulloway? So the Mulloway would be, without doubt, my favourite fish to hunt. I feel like you have to get into a whole different zone to hunt a Mulloway. You don't just, you know, sometimes you might just stumble across one. I've speared, I've speared Mulloway before. I've just found one. But, like, you, you, you actively go out there to shoot Mulloway, you have to learn all the spots where they're in, and then you know you ha- it's it's a real hunting process. And mm. when when you see one in the water with its diamonds down its back, and yeah. you know, and you just it's almost intimidating. Like you sort of see it, and you're like, oh my god! Like they're so big and they're so dominant. And then when you spear one, like I, I don't know, I just get a real buzz out of it. Plus, I, like I love eating them. Um, yeah. But for me, they're just the ultimate hunting fish because you just you're in a whole different zone. Like mm. I find, just before I get in, like I have to almost like I sort of go into like a zen sort of thing, like where I'm sitting there and I'm just like breathing, and and then you get in and you're just like you you're trying not to breathe loudly and you're just like kicking really slowly and yeah. it's just a really like different way to hunt as opposed to just going out and you know, jigging and like, you know, using your flashes and burling and all these things. And I just really enjoy that side of hunting. And um, yeah, right. Yeah, it's just, it's very different to hunting any other fish, I think. Mm, mm. Mm. I have spuriously sort of taken them at times, often in not, not deeper water, but they can be taken and are often taken really shallow. And yeah. as, as you probably know, I don't like to give everything away. Um, but like they are a special fish. I have noticed at times that there'll be bark missing off them, you know, like they've been scraped up and and roughed up. And my Mm. suspicion, and I would love to hear your guys' thoughts on this, is that uh, one of their main predators is the grey nurse. What what do you think about that? Absolutely. Um, In the old days when... um when uh, grey nurse were on the um, the schedule for the game fishermen, um, they used to catch um, soapy jewfish, the little ones, mm. and use them as live bait. Uh-huh. I've, I've heard stories of that. And, um, and one very good game fisherman used to go and fish in, in the murk where they used to discharge the, you know, the sewage right at the cliff face. And uh, he and his uh, crew would catch, I mean, half a dozen soapy jewfish, take them out and use them as live bait. Um, and so, yeah, no, I'd, I'd completely go along with that. Uh, they occupy very similar habitats. Mm. You know, they like caves and sort of similar similar sort of depths, actually. They, they both extend out into quite deep water and also into shallow water. Mm. Uh, I've, I've done a bit of research on grey nurse sharks and, and we found um, the little pups, the, the really small grey nurse in very, very shallow water. Mm. And I think they go in there because I think there's a bit of cannibalism that goes on as well. Ah. So, um, so they get away from you know the big ones, and um, and they use very shallow gutters as nursery habitat. So yeah, I I'd go along with that, and I know great whites um, chomp into grey nurse now and again as well. So yeah, they're you know they're but I, I mean. I, I wish I saw as many Jewies as I see um, Grey Nurse, to tell yes, you the truth. Yes, 100%. I think uh, they've, they've made a big comeback, which is really pleasing. Yeah. yeah. Well, we needed, you know, I, I understand that big big rain is great for um, an uptick in Jewfish population, but th- that the, the difference or well, the time period between when you have good rain and then when you start to see mature – what do you understand about growth rates with Jewfish and and sort of how is their population affected? What are the main things contributing to their decline in numbers? Well, I've done I've done a fair bit of work in estuaries, um, sampling fish and other things, and um, and I I'm quite concerned that in some places um, the trawlers, the prawn trawlers, are picking up a lot of very very small uh, moai and. Um, and I think the um, 
the recreational um, fishing havens that they have where where there is no more commercial uh, fishing, I think is a really good thing for the Mulloway, um, particularly places like Sydney Harbour, which is quite deep, um, Hunter River. Um, you know, it, they're very important nursery habitats and the fact that now uh, there's no uh, prawn trawling in there uh, is, is really good. But nevertheless, I mean, you you know, uh, uh, offshore fishing, if if you want to, um, and the, the jewfish are around, um, you can catch quite a lot, you know, much more than your bag limit because they're schooling and they're cruising around there. And, um, and that's something that people have to be mindful of. Their swim bladders can't cope with uh, with rapid um, yep. coming up the water column, and they. Yeah. I understand that their catch and release rate, mortality rate, is just woeful. Yeah, well, it depends where they're caught, obviously, but in deeper water, absolutely, you're right. Some uh, people have ar- some people have argued that we should remove uh, the size limits for line fishermen so that there's no catch and release. What do you think of that? Uh, I I'd be very wary about that. I I think we I think the way we're going now is 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 pretty good. I think there's a lot still to learn, um, but I think catch and size limits are really important. The, the size limits really should be related to um, e- onset of maturity as well, so that um, so that if you've got a size limit that that's less than the, the breeding size. Then that's not particularly helpful. But yeah. if you allow them to have, uh, it's probably not the right word, but if they can, if they can spawn for two or three years uh, without being taken, I think that's something to to move towards. Uh, but we need to do more research, and yeah. I know a fair bit of that work is being done now. Can you? So, yeah. Can you just fill me in on their life cycle? Like, where do they spawn, and how does that? Operate as as it specifically with Jewies, if you could. I don't I don't know enough about them, and I would love to be less ignorant. <laughs> yeah, I me too. Um, <laughs> I, I they're, they're pretty mysterious. Mm. Um, I, I haven't done directly done research on them, okay. but um, from what I understand, they're they're inshore spawners, uh, unlike species like brim, which which shoal up on ocean beaches and spawn. Uh, the Mulloway, they move in and out of the estuaries, and um, I suspect they're spawning very close to to the shore. And as I said a bit earlier, you see a lot of the really small juveniles in the deeper estuaries. So um, my my guess is they'd be they'd be spawning close to the estuaries um, or adjacent to them, where the currents will bring the eggs in. Mm. I don't I don't know much about their age uh, yeah. structure. Uh, or when they become reproductively active, but um, there's plenty of people who are, who are working on that, so you'd need to speak to them about that. Hey guys, not sure how you stay hydrated out on the boats on those long days out on the water, uh, but staying hydrated is absolutely critical to good, good equalisation and looking after your body, making sure you're not doing those awkward one-legged kicks to the surface when, when one leg cramps out on you. Go to aqualite.com.au and get yourself a box of sachets. You just simply add them to water. It's less than $1.28 per serve. Cheaper and cheaper and healthier than any other sports drinks on the market. Aqualite will make a difference in your spearfishing. Check it out at aqualite.com.au. Use the code NoobSpiro to save 10% on any order. Check it out. Aqualite, made in Western Australia. Old Man Blue. .com.au. You can't cheat experience, you can't fake passion, and damn, Old Man Blue can make gear that will last and stand the test of time. Check it out at Old Man Blue Dive on Instagram. Are you in the market for a new spear gun? Killshot Spear Guns has got blue water wahoo tuna guns, open track spear guns, enclosed track spear guns, rear handle enclosed tracks. Check them out at killshotspearguns.com. Even better, I've got some good news for you. You can save $30 on any Killshot Spear Gun at killshotspearguns.com. Use the code NOOB. If you're in store, just say, Crikey, mate, or say Shrek from the Noob Spiro sent you, and you'll save $30. Ed Martin at killshotspearguns.com. Check them out. Emma, 
a broad question. Uh, still a shit fight one, though. Uh, I like to be controversial sometimes, so excuse me. Um, do you think that Aspero's ethics should be informed purely by bag and size limits, or do you think we should be a little bit more nuanced than that in our understanding and, our, and the way we go about conducting ourselves spearfishing? I think it's an individual responsibility to to understand your environment and, you know, take the time to to kind of, I guess, be, you know, aware of how how fragile our system is and, like, you know, I think as human beings we have a bit of a responsibility to, mm. to be not we, – we shouldn't be so um, – I guess, oh, what's the word? We should, we should Casual, be. Heavily. Yeah, like I think we're just so focused on, you know, on um, what we can take in that moment and, you know, that down the track it doesn't matter. But I think we do, we have a responsibility to to look after the things that we're, that are living with us in that moment. And, you know, like I want my children to be able to, be able to go out and catch fish and see fish and, you know, and their children and down the line. And I think, yeah, I think every person who, every person, not just Spiro, has a bit of a responsibility to to take care of their environment and to be aware of, you know, of how how fragile it really is. So, yeah, me, yeah, yeah, I just think, like, it's not okay to kind of be really complacent with with things and to you know to just take 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 like yeah i i think we we as humans should be a bit more wary of how how fragile our ecosystem really is i guess could i just have a comment there that um, i think the bag and the size limits are important i think spear fishermen spear fishers need to think about where on the body of a fish they're spearing it and understand um, and not take rash shots, which are going to um, wound the fish and potentially kill it without a capture. Uh, there are some fish like, like wahoo, for example, Spanish mackerel. Spears tear out very quickly, very mm. easily. Other fish, um, but you've got nice big fat scales, so you, you've got a bit better chance because it's more holding. Mm. And I think that that's something that, the, the more mature divers can pass on to people that they take out. Say, look, don't just have a shot. Have a have a think about where you're placing your spear, mm. and and also um, you know euthanizing them. I guess once you've shot them, to make sure that um, you know they don't suffer for too long. Mm. Do it as quickly as you can. So, you know, I would think that's something that as as spearos we should all be passing on. To yeah, people love it. coming through, and if you see people just taking rash shots, say, "Listen, that you know that was silly. You know, you've got to yeah. think about it a bit yeah. more." Next I like time. it. That's a he good. Was, he was always pretty firm on me. If I took a shot, and you know, it was a terrible shot, and yeah. it ripped out, you know, it was. He'd like, "Well, why? Why did you take that shot? You know, you weren't in a good position. It was." And I really re- appreciate that, like yeah. now, because. You know, I don't want to hurt a fish and then, you know, not even get to take it home. Like I'll, I'm pretty calculated with my shots, as we both are, I guess. Um, yep. And, you know, like it's also good because if you get a really good shot on it, you know, the, if it, there's more sharks around at the moment. There's less chance that a shark's going to grab it or whatever. Like, mm. you you know, the, the more calculated you are with that shot, the more likelihood you are you're going to get to take it home. And, and when you lose a good fish, there's – there's nothing worse like yeah, seeing yeah. it swimming off. It's like it's the most horrible feeling and you just, yeah, you don't want that to happen. Well, I, I, I mean, I probably lose a lot more fish than I might necessarily do because I I make sure I line them up and, um, you know, if the fish swims away or if it's a bit too far away, I don't like taking really long shots and I think that's something that, you know, people should, be really cognizant of when they're when they're going after fish. Yeah, I was going to say I had two thoughts about that. One, I, one, one is like um, when I started, I tried to save money and buy a cheap spear gun. And I think mm-hmm. cheap gear, like I'm not saying like don't save money and be careful with your money and stuff, 
But sometimes there are rubbish spear guns on the market and they are just crap. They're not accurate. They don't do the job and no one should sell them as far as I'm concerned because they mm. just send you fish. Oh, I had one, so I know. And I ended up, the poor man pays twice, they say. And um, <laughs> so I, I think there's a bit of res- responsibility on people to sell good gear. Um, and then yeah. the other reason I, I think some of us take those hit and hope shots, it's a bit of a scarcity mindset. There's this idea like I'm only going to get one chance and mm. m- maybe you will only get one chance, but if you, yeah. you know, is it, it's not worth the, the payoff, you know, holding up you know, fish that are, been poorly shot I, I think sometimes is is sometimes you'd rather just see it go i don't know yeah yeah sometimes you, you wish you'd taken that shot as well though like i've had i still <laughs> i still oh, think about oh, fish oh. where i'm like yeah oh there was a big cobia a while back and it was probably seven years ago and i still think about this <laughs> fish. Like, I, I just yeah. watched it swim off and i'm like i could have had a shot but i didn't but there's a it's, yeah it's one of those things like yeah. There's a que- there's a question I ask most guests. It's like, what's your mem- most memorable fish? You know, and uh, the the first thought that most spearers have is not the the the, the most memorable fish that they've taken. It's the yeah. most memorable fish that they missed out on because yeah. um, those ones stay with you. I think, but that's part yeah. of that journey of mastery too. It's like, you know, yeah. they become more desirable the more time and effort you've spent in trying to hunt them. Yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah. We've all we've all we've had been, those yeah. experiences, and it's it just yeah it haunts you. Like <laughs> I've lost I lost a really big dewy a while back, and I just I speared it, and it, it got off. I don't know how it got off. It got off, and I still think about it. Like I yeah I just remember just sticking my head out of the water and just scream like swearing like. <laughs> And just, yeah, I was like, I don't even know how I'm going to get him back into shore. I just, like, <laughs> but yeah, you just, it's, it's just that kind of sport, isn't it? You just like, yeah, yeah. you can't let some things go. It's an, it's an obsession. It, it really is. Marcus, one of the articles or, or bits of research you've done and really intrigued me, it was quantifying or understanding the extra pressure that an area will face given increased population. So I put that awkwardly, but um, basically like heavily populated areas have heavily depleted fisheries. Um, talk to me about that if you can and what that research looked like and how you feel about it now. Oh, uh, well, I mean, basically it comes down to comparing um, sites that aren't heavily fished with sites that, that are or even in intermediately intermediately um, fished. And um, look, it's it's actually very complicated because, um, I mean, fish will learn to avoid people. Mm. So there might be a perception that there's fewer fish when they're just buggering off. Yep. Um, so you, you really need to be really, really careful about that. But there's some, been some really interesting techniques that have um, started to be used. Um, one that, that we use is called a BRUV, which is a baited underwater video. So you basically have a have a, a video mounted in a housing. You have it attached to a to a like a, um, a frame, and out the front front of the frame you have a piece of PVC arm with um, a lump of fish in a um, in a in a mesh bag. Okay. So we can. We can actually correct for the presence of a diver by using something that doesn't um, have a diver, and um, and you can use it in places where it's too deep to practically dive. Um, I've used it on the northwest shelf, looking at pipelines to see what sort of fish are gathering around the pipelines. Wow. So yeah, and it's and you get amazing footage that way of tiger sharks and big cod and that sort of thing. Yeah. Cool. So look. Um, it does come down to research. It's not an easy, uh, no. an easy fix to understand. Mm. Um, and you know, maybe we have to err on the side of being a bit precautionary in terms of management sometimes, just to uh, make sure we don't, you know, overdo it. Uh, There's that old saying: "Nature does not exist in a vacuum." And I think yeah. that confounding variables with testing anything in the ocean make it very problematic. Was yeah. that was. W- the reason you thought about that was that due to that research that was done in the med, where they essentially measured 
um, the distance that fish stayed away from sparrows with with uh, continuing pressure. Because I read yeah, an article about that. I'm not familiar with that article. Okay. I'll have to get you to send it to me. I'll but, try to, um, yeah. Yeah, a lot of it evolved in New Zealand. Um, mm. And I, I reviewed a few papers early on where um, New Zealanders have been, been looking at that idea. But, yes, it is used in the med. Um, it's also used um, in the United States. I've seen work on the East Coast comparing um, uh, reserves with, with fished areas. Yeah. So, um, so, yeah, I mean, it's it's just one of the tools that we have. And, and um, sonar, you know, the echo sounders, I mean, they're getting very, very sophisticated now. And some people can even identify species from, from the images on a very, very good sounder. Good fish yeah. shows can do that. I've, just, I've seen them do it. It's it's pretty yeah. crazy. I, mm, yeah. I, I was get, I was going to say, like a lot of the these papers you do, like it's about equilibrium, isn't it? Like nature has it built into it these inbuilt protective mechanisms. We just kind of don't understand that you can push an ecosystem so far out of balance that it can't recover on its own, and we see that with like urchin barrens and things like that. Can you can you talk to that concept and as a person? pursuing your line of work for so long, how do you communicate with average Spiros about sort of core scientific concepts like that? It's very difficult because people get set in their ways um, and I think you've just got to keep, um, you've got to keep just pushing the story. Um, I actually take a little bit of an exception with uh, the urchin barons okay. um, because I I find that, that you tend to get a lot of uh, a lot of fish around the urchin barrens, and um, we always used to call it white rock. We never called it barrens, and I just don't think barrens is an appropriate term. Okay, uh, people think that a kelp bed is like it might be more productive in terms of you know producing biomass, but um, in terms of supporting fish, um, they like to have crevices. And crevices is where urchins and crays live. But the urchins, they come out of the um, out of the um, crevices to feed, and they're scraping the rocks clean. And um, so, look, it, it is a very complicated issue. I I, I take the point that um, they seem to be advancing further southward now, and um, and that's not good at all because down down around Tassie, um, you know, they've got that bull kelp. And that's um, that's an incredibly structured sort of habitat. So mm. it's a little bit different. But um, I, you know, I, I was just going to say that the concept of equilibrium is a difficult one because things are always changing anyway. So yeah. an equilibrium might just mean there's a lot of change happening all the time. But it's when you get to that tipping point and you tip it over, and and you, then you're in big trouble. So. With a lot of urchin bar- barrens, like they overpopulate an area and then the yield of, you know, like the gonads that you get out of these urchins, they, as I understand it, they get poorer and poorer because there's less for them to eat and then eventually they starve off and die but they seem to live a lot longer than people think that they might and then they they can starve an area and then is it do they eventually die off and then the area regenerates? Um, I mean, I don't understand all of it. I, I, I've done right. a li- little bit of reading, which makes me dangerous, yeah. maybe. All right. <laughs> me too. <laughs> um, look, um, I'm not a great urchin expert, mm. but I, I am familiar with some of the early research where um, they have actually cleared urchins away uh, in a scientific experiment, and they've found that um, you go through a process of recolonization, different species of algae, um, getting all the way up to the kelps. So, um, look oh, if if they do um, if they do the nude. Sorry, it's just mom. that's that's the yeah, other okay. boss we were talking about before. <laughs> <laughs> so, look if they do if they do crash and burn ultimately, um, then there's enough um, of the seeds, if you like, or spores of of the algae that they will recolonize. Yeah. So um, it might. It might alter the time scale of those sorts of events, mm. um, but I'm pretty optimistic that um, there's enough habitat left. Like there's a lot of kelp in quite deep water. Um, yeah. I've dived in kelp beds off um, Morton Island at, at 25, 30 metres depth, 
and yeah, they're right. just covered with kelp beds. But you don't see. Oh, any oh, you're talking. I know where you're talking. I've, I've been there myself. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. Some of those reefs out there are pretty amazing, actually. Yeah. We had a guy die in one of those reefs uh, when I was really starting to come up. And he, oh, uh, really? Oh, yeah, because you get a lot of yellowtail kingfish out on this particular reef and um, around one of those kelpie reefs you're talking about. And yeah, yeah. I think he, he got a muzzle wrap on his reel and tried oh, to wrestle God. it and, and he drowned, unfortunately. Oh, um, God. Yeah. yeah, but these hor- horror stories are throughout our community. Like, uh, they don't happen yeah. a lot, but they do happen uh, uh, as long as we all learn from it, I think. I love that feeling underwater when you pull the trigger and you know exactly where that shaft is going. You want something dependable. You want to put that fish that you've been chasing for a lifetime in the boat, in the cooler, in the esky, in the chili bin if you're in New Zealand. Why do we call all these things different names? Anyway, today's show sponsor, KillshotSpearGuns.com, make awesome wooden timber spear guns. A fantastic shooting platform. If you've ever shot a big timber gun, you know the, the reliability that you get from these things. Eh? He mostly makes enclosed track spear guns. Visit him at killshotspearguns.com. Use the code NOOB to save $30 on any Killshot spear gun. Ocean Guardian is the world's leading shark deterrent technology. And the great news is they're now partners with the Noob Throw podcast. You can save 10% on the Freedom 7 or Scuba 7 when you shop at Ocean Guardian. Uh, use the code NoobSpiro at checkout to save 10%. If you want to go there, easy, super easy, go to noobspiro.com forward slash OG. Short for Ocean Guardian, pretty original, eh? Pump in the code NoobSpiro and you'll save 10% on your Shark Shield device. Get into it, get amongst it. Ocean Guardian are doing awesome things for Spiro. This podcast is brought to you by aqualite.com.au. This is the best solution bar none for staying hydrated in the ocean. If you're a Spiro, it's an absolute no-brainer. It's a game changer. If you're doing extended trips and the cramp starts to set in and uh, the old body's telling you, hey, that's enough, just get hydrated and it will save you a whole heap of woe. It's a groundbreaking product that can help you to stay hydrated. It's got low sugar, it's less acidic than other options on the market, it's rapid absorption, help you to maintain performance. Dehydration of just one to 2% can affect your mental and physical performance by up to six or 7%. And as when you're spearfishing, you can tell when dehydration is starting to affect you because the equalization goes out the window. Get Aqualite at aqualite.com.au. It's scientific rehydration that Spiros know and trust. I know because one works there, and that's why we've set up this discount code for you. 10% off when you use the code NoobSpiro at aqualite.com.au. Check it out. Australian-made hydration products tailored for Spiros and a whole bunch of other people that suffer from dehydration too. But check it out at aqualite.com.au. Use the code NoobSpiro to save 10%. Let's return to a few infinite practicalities. Marcus, do you, do you still go spearfishing quite a lot or? Uh, not as much as I did or as I'd like to. Um, okay. I'm certainly losing a, a little bit of my touch. Yeah. But yes, I still I still love spearfishing. Um, I mean, we, we go out and go after the dolphin fish sometimes on the on the fads. That's, that's fun and, and it's like what we were talking about earlier you're sort of drifting past the fad and you see all these baby fish um, that are just hanging there. You see the oceanic leather jackets and uh, baby kingfish. And if you're lucky, there'll be, you know, um, decent-sized um, dolphin fish around. Um, so that sort of thing is is something I get a real kick out of. Um, oh. I go up to the, um, up to the uh, Barrier Reef at times. I haven't been up for a couple of years, but I've got some friends up there. And I love doing that. Mm. Uh, and I just love swimming around, you know, here in Sydney. Um, you know, I'm not as good on my legs clambering over rocks to go rock hopping uh, yeah. as I used to be. But, you know, I'm still still getting out there when I can. Ah, we cool. call him Turtle Boy because he's, um, he's pretty slow on the land. But uh, <laughs> in the water, he, he goes all right. Yeah. Oh, nice. That's cool. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'll get to you later. Yeah. <laughs> I won't be going out to the fads anytime soon now. <laughs> no, no, that's true. 
Talk to me yeah. about um, shooting dolphin fish. You were talking about shot placement before. They are a fish that um, can cause mm-hmm. a bit of havoc. Um, where do you like to shoot a dolphin fish? Oh, I like it just behind the gills, really, like in the centre. It just holds on to the fish. I've lost I've lost a lot of dolphin fish before. I think everyone who's sh- tried to shoot dolphin fish has, has lost them because they're, you shoot them too high, it rips out. You shoot them too low, it rips out. Like, yeah, they're, they're very easy to lose. But just behind the gills, I find, is the, that best spot. Yeah. I still haven't shot a big one. I would love to. They're a cool fish and they have yeah. such a good eating, eh? Oh. So. Yeah, I, I haven't got a huge one. My biggest is 13 kilos. That's um, huge. That's oh, huge. You, get, you do get bigger ones out there. Yeah. You get them to 20 or something, I think. 20 kilos. Oh, bigger. Even yeah. bigger. But, um, yeah, they're a thin fish. So, mm. you know, if you don't have a good placement, the chances are it will tear out. And they, they react. You know, they don't go docile when you spear them. They they go crazy. So um, shot placement is everything. Another species you've made the shirt on is a, is a kingy. Um, walk us through your season for chasing them and then what that looks like, if you like, Emma. Like um, how do you target them these days? Yeah, so I guess, I don't know, like some seasons I've found there's just, there's just they're everywhere and then other times I've, seasons I've been out and you just you hardly see any or you just see rats and yeah I just like I don't know I guess sort of October around Sydney like October November or September October you get the really Mm. big ones coming through like you tend to get the you know 20 kilo plus ones coming through but it's it's been quite busy out Sydney lately diving and um, if I see too many floats out I sort of just try and go somewhere else um, from my usual spot. So um, just because coming back to what, you know, I, I try to get out there to get away from people, not to <laughs> not to bump into people too much. So, yeah, it's – but um, I don't know. Like you just never know when you're going to see them. I've seen them in winter before. You just you just got to be ready. I've seen them when I've just been looking for craze and I've just dropped my gun – you know, 50 metres away and I've just been rock hopping, you know, crawling along the reef and then they've just swum past me in one to two metres depth and you don't even have your gun and they just swim straight past you. So, yeah, it's um, you just never know when you're going to see them, I guess. But summer's definitely the best time of year for them. Mm. Yeah, I completely agree. We used to always think of them being there in summertime and then we started seeing a few of the the big ones sort of September-ish. Um, but now they, they they can turn up any time. They seem to, mm. you know, to be a little bit less seasonal but still predominantly in summertime. What's your what's your minimum size there? Is it? 65 it is. Okay. I'm pretty sure, yeah, 65 centimetres. And now what's your – you're allowed five or something as well, aren't you, in New South Wales? Is that right? <sighs> I'm not sure. I haven't looked for a while because I haven't yeah. speared any. Um, yeah. Yeah. It might be five. Yeah. 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 Queensland, you're allowed two now, and our minimum size is 60 centimetres. But it's interesting to see how they recalculate them. Um, like you say, like they, they want to get at least a season of reproduction out of them before we're yeah. taking them out. So, um, yeah. How responsive <laughs> – here's a ship fight question for you, Marcus. How responsive do you think our our state and territory fisheries management bodies are? Do you think – are we doing a good job? Like, um, and like, even if we just pick on New South Wales for a sec, I mean, if you if you could wave a magic wand, what would be one or two things that you would change instantly? Um, in terms of management or just in terms of the environment? Fisheries management. Well – They've got some. They've got lots of committees. Um, there's a recreational fishing committee, um, and they they are charged with using the license money for research uh, yeah. and also for other things like maybe building a you know a fish cleaning station in a place where they need to have it and and stuff related to um, rock fishermen and um, you know safety matters. So look there. Their things. I, I think it's. I think it's. It's really good that they've got these um, systems in place, and they've got. Um, they've got committees for commercial fishing as well. 
Uh, I I think it's it's just a sort of the problem with with people nowadays is that everybody's got a different view, and it just takes a long time to get people moving in the same direction. So I mean, you sometimes you'd like to think, well, fisheries should just say, right, this is what we think should be done, um, but there is a lot of consultation required, and um, I don't I don't know how to really change that. I think the structure yeah. that they have is pretty good for looking at different issues. Um, we're doing some work at the moment looking at um, debris associated with recreational fishing, um, trying to understand if that's a big problem and how big it might be. Um, but it takes a long time to, you know, to understand what's going on. Uh, and then you, you write a report and it needs to be reviewed and it, it goes on and on. So it, I think it's just it's just the way the world is these days. It takes a long time to to actually get everyone moving in the right direction. And and even then you you're always going to have people who are not happy with that direction. So oh, okay. I, I, awesome. I've got no I've got no magic wand that I say if I was the boss of everything, this is what I'd do. Um, that's good. You've got a you've got a, a a perspective that's been informed by experience and wisdom, which is Pretty much, you know, the opposite that, that I have, which is great, which is why I asked you the question. <laughs> I think um, I think having a series of checks and balances and a longer consultation process is great because it means that you can't get a dictator in there that has one particular ideology that can kind of, you know, just determine what's going to happen from now on because – yeah. Um, and, and, and it should be a process that goes through a series of checks and balances. So, no, that's, that's great. Yeah. I, I, can, I can give you one really good example – and that is the kingfish traps that were around a few decades ago. Um, in those days, I was doing a lot of spearing around the gap off Sydney, and um, we'd swim around the kingfish traps. And um, and these fish, you know, they were being bashed. Um, they'd, they'd put a trap down about five metres below the surface. They'd put a mirror in there or a, some big lump of chrome, and it would attract the kingies in. And, you know, a lot of the time if the seas got rough, the fish, you know, wouldn't be harvested. And so they're all just um, getting really in bad shape, you know, being scratched on the on the sides of the cages. And um, the then fisheries um, minister, he came in over the top and just banned them. He made an executive decision. And I thought it was a great decision because we were, we were seeing the damage that was being done. But it's very – and he, he got a lot of criticism for that as well. Mm. Um, but every now and again, that things are so self-evident that that you need to move really quickly. But yeah. most of the time, you know, there's always different angles to these things. But with mm. the kingfish traps, I think my personal view is that that was a great decision made, you know, as an executive decision. And, you know, I thought it was it was well done, but, but that, that's not the – the norm mm. um, because there are so many different competing views. Well, if you're a, a, a kingfish trap person and you made a living doing that at that time, I'd imagine that that would have been pretty devastating. So there is always a mm. multiple yeah. facets exactly. to every sort of story. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Ah, cool. All right. We went hot and heavy there. Sorry about that. Um, <laughs> Ask her something. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to. No, I'm going to. I need to get a cup of tea. <laughs> Emma, who's your, who are um, like in your dive crew now? Who are your favourite people to go diving with? Oh, it's always Dad. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, just because we've we've all I feel safe with him. Like even though you know, like I just I think because I grew up with him next to me diving, he he always was there. Like. You know, he loaded my gun. He, if I speared a fish, I'd just give the gun to him and he'd take care of the fish. This is when I was younger, you know, and yeah. like he just helped me through everything. And I think it's a comfort thing for me. Like, um, yeah. but I've got a lot of people that I go diving with these days. I've got a few people around the area and um, one of dad's good mates, Adam Smith, who lives up in Queensland. He's a, a marine biologist as well. And he's amazing. Like, he's an amazing diver. But, um, Anyone who who want to go diving with me, I'm happy to go diving. I just I just want to go diving all the time. So whoever's I, willing, I've I've heard through 
through the traps that you're a bit of a gun diver too. Do you ever compete? Do you have a desire no, to compete? I, I've thought about it. I've thought maybe I'd do the odd competition. Maybe the Blue Water Classic is probably something yep. that I might consider. But um, I don't know how I feel about yep. competition diving. I mean, I, I can't say because I've never done it before, so I don't want um, to poo-poo on it. But, um, yeah, I don't know. I just – it's like – surfing like I never competed in surfing even though I, I potentially could have back in the day I just it, it's I don't know I always co- competed in something like yeah 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 know, I was so competitive in skeleton and then I went on to play rugby and it's almost like I love to just have something where I'm not competing yep. even though I do compete with like people who I go out diving with <laughs> like you always want to get the biggest fish don't you like yeah. um but yeah it's it's I don't know. I just, I just like getting out. But, are uh, you, are you a good buddy? Um, I don't know. Am I? Have your moments. Yeah. <laughs> no, she's very good. <laughs> she's very good. Okay. I'm pretty competitive, so yeah. um, that's probably yeah. my biggest downfall. Is um, you know, if like it's like we got to get in the water. Who I'm pr- probably going to be the first one in the water, and I'm probably going to be the first one to take a shot. Um, <laughs> for the most part, but. That's only because I dive with, you know, the slow, the old guys. So um, <laughs> it's not hard to be first in the water, to be honest. <laughs> Boy, am I getting hammered. Yeah. You are. You're getting owned. She called you the turtle before and now she's That's saying, a compliment. Yeah. That's, a, that's a compliment. <laughs> well, in, um, in San Diego, they, they had these groups called the Mossbacks. I don't know, I don't oh, know yeah. if, you, if you remember that, but it was a similar sort of idea. It was that oh, yeah. Much, Spend that much time in the water, they've got moss growing off their backs, and it was yeah. a lot of older divers as well. So, yeah, that's pretty cool. If your buddy had a blackout on your next spear fishing trip, think what would the outcome of that be? Do you know how to revive someone from a blackout? Would you even be in a position to do something about it, or would you be diving, chasing after a fish as your buddy sinks down to the bottom of the ocean? Do you know where most blackouts happen? Do you know what you can do to minimize your risk of having a blackout? My name is Ted Hardy, and I'm the founder of freedivingsafety.com. In my free online course, you will learn the truth about shallow water blackout, the myth of I don't push myself, I know my limits, I'm in tune with my body, how to minimize your risk of having a blackout, and most importantly, how to save your buddy's life if they have one. Visit freedivingsafety.com to sign up for your free course today. Dive safe out there. It's, It's not even that hard. Freediving for Spearfishers at howtofreedive.com will help you to extend your breath hold, understand your body better, and put you in a better position when you actually get to go out spearfishing. This program is not for noobs, as this program is for people who have some diving under their belts and understand some basic spearfishing safety, but it's perfect for spearers who want a guided, easy to follow and complete program with videos, a clear process, and a set goal. The five minute freediver works. Get started for free and see if it's for you at howtofreedive.com. There's a tester there. Use the code NOOBSPERO, N-O-O-B-S-P-E-A-R-O to save some money if you do decide to purchase. Check it out at howtofreedive.com. Freediving for spearfishers, a fantastic way to prepare, especially if you've got a big trip coming up. Get to that five-minute mark, and it does translate to your diving at howtofreedive.com. So... Obviously, your dad's been a massive mentor for you, Emma, in the water, and Adam sounds like he's the same. I've heard a bit about him before in the past. Any other mentors? What What were the other sort of resources or things you leaned on in order to get better? Um, I guess recently Instagram because you watch everyone sort of has a GoPro on their head. Um, I don't be with a GoPro, but um, I do enjoy watching – other people's footage, I, you know, all the guys up at Coffs Harbour have some really great footage. There's one um, page, the Nautical Productions, and um, yeah, they, they, they're amazing. Like, yeah. you know, I just froth on everything that they post and not just because they spear amazing fish as well, but because they do post just beautiful footage of oh, fish. the fish. Yeah, yeah, and I just I love watching all their all their stuff. So um, yeah, thanks guys. I appreciate all the stuff that you do. And yeah, I think um, you know everyone's sort of got got their own little um, 
footage that they post these days or whatever. So you can always learn something off someone else's um, shot placements and, you know, how they how they hunt and stalk underwater. So, yeah, I'm just, yeah. Have you ever had any, like, really scary experiences in the water? Yeah, so Dad and I had a, we had a big great white circleless a couple of years back off North Head. Um, I was on the bottom of the water, uh, on the bottom of the ocean, and it was getting dark. It was sort of in winter, it was about five o'clock, so it was at dusk sort of time. And I was just sitting underneath a school of yellowtail or yuccas just bait and um, just waiting to see if a kingy came through. And I just felt really uncomfortable in a presence and I just turned to my side and I just saw it was a four meter white just cruising on the bottom <laughs> and I panicked as as you would and I swam up to the top and I, I and when I sort of reacted the shark reacted as well it, it started being like a bit more it arced up a bit a bit yeah and I yelled out to dad who was probably 50 or so meters away and I'm like dad and I start swimming towards him and this shark's underneath me. He thought I had a big kingfish, so he was all excited and then sees this big great white. I was more always. excited when I saw it. And then um, it just it just wouldn't go away. It circled us. It swam underneath us, like right underneath our feet. Um, I was, we were both terrified. We literally just had shoulder, shoulder to shoulder and just had our guns out. And then it swam away and then it, turned and started charging at us and dad actually pushed me behind him to to save me which I appreciate and um but I don't know what I would have done and had if it had have gone for him I would, who knows I, I think about it a lot and then it just turned and swam off it didn't um you know it just disappeared out of into the blue and we didn't see it again and we had a quite a long swim back to to the rock shelf where we got in and it was a very long swim back. Dad suggested that we cut across the deeper water to get back, and I said, no, we're going along the rock edge, but it was quite a steep cliff, so we couldn't really get out at that point. But um, that's definitely the scariest moment that I've had. Like, it, was, it was horrible, but it was also like an experience that I'm so glad that I had because to see a white that big, that close, and you know it, it was it was an amazing experience that sort of experience is you know you know that could have proved the end of spearfishing for you guys yeah oh, and it, everything else yeah i mean it was yeah. it was that night i didn't sleep i don't know about dad but it, you know i i just remember getting up the next day and i thought i just need to get in the water straight away i need to go i went for a surf and then we actually went up to foster the next week, probably one of the worst places you could go, but we went diving up around Foster area and um, and then, you know, had to, you just had to get back in the water straight away. But we, we actually, um, since then, we were pretty diligent about wearing shark shields. Okay. So I, I wear them pretty much most of the time I go diving. So does Dad. Just It just is that little bit of peace of mind and, um, you know, it's a precaution that, like you can take and it's yes they're expensive but they might just save your life as well so yeah they, they actually partner up with the podcast people can get a discount now if they listen to the news for a podcast and use our code mm-hmm. I'll put, oh yeah i'll put that in yeah. today's show notes so people yeah. go to noobspiro.com forward slash ocean ranges i'll link up uh, anything and everything we chat up about today as well as that shark shield how do you guys fit it, are you running it down the side of your fins with Seekerflex or is it just hanging around your ankle? How do you, how do you manage that? Yeah, just use it around the ankle with the Velcro. Okay. Um, I, I actually liken it to um, wearing a seatbelt. You're wearing a seatbelt and you get in a car crash, you're not guaranteed to survive, but it lessens the chances of you dying or being terribly wounded. And, and the shark shield may not work in every situation, but... I think it's very good insurance to have. Mm. So, and I don't work for them. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. but I use them like in in my commercial diving work for research. Uh, we have to wear a shark shield no matter where we are, okay. apart from in freshwater, obviously. But um, 
And, you know, often we're diving in really shallow water. I've done a lot of work at um, Lake Macquarie. And um, and I, I was – one of my study sites was quite close to where a guy got attacked a couple okay. of years ago. Um, and, it, look, it's a it's a real pain wearing them, um, particularly in very shallow water because the thing the sort of drips, pa- drifts past your head and, yeah, all that. But um, – as far, um, as far as I'm concerned, you know, you, you really need to think very carefully about not wearing one when you're out in the water. Yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah, I didn't realize that about you both. That's interesting. Tell mm. me about these shirts you're wearing. What's what's happening with this Ocean Rangers okay. thing, Emma? So this is... Um, there you go. This is my kingfish one. So yeah, I want nice. to stand up and... Uh, so yeah. it's got it's got O R on the chest with a yep. spear gun through the middle. That's your kind of so your main logo. Uh, the Ocean Rangers, and yep. then um, so it has got the black, the grey. Yeah. Uh, ah, yeah, nice. And then uh, I hope that's all you can see. Look yeah, at your dad. And that's He's such a fantastic model. English. So yeah, my yeah, mum. That's right. My mum drew them all. Um, yeah. Wow. Well. She's very creative. She's so, a very creative woman, and um, I love that I've got mum, dad, and myself involved yeah. in it. And, um, it's a bit of a family affair and yeah, I mean I I I don't plan on making a living out of selling T shirts, but um I always I've spent you know, thousands of dollars on salty crew stuff and I thought, <laughs> you know, like I'm just gonna make my own T shirt. So yeah. Um, yeah, I've just decided to, to do it. It's been, you know, I've been thinking about it for a while and then, yeah, as I said, just had a bit of time and finally got, got things going. So, yeah, Ocean Rangers. I'm sort of hoping to come out with some hoodies as well at some point and, and the next fish to come along is a dolphin fish. Um, you know, I'll do the dolphin fish and then a crayfish eventually and All just right. keep adding species onto my my list of of. Um, things to, to purchase so Love yeah it. it's just a bit of fun and and um you know I, I i'm happy i'm happy happy with them how they all came out so yeah, yeah they look oh, they great. Look good yeah. yeah i like them i'm gonna get one um awesome. is the easiest way to go to instagram.com forward slash ocean rangers underscore apparel that's right yeah, yeah. that's that's it yeah all right sick Love yeah. it. yeah yeah I, I like seeing people do new stuff and it, it's celebrating our lifestyle and it's paying a bit of honour to the fish because like you kind of identified about that Nautical Productions Instagram channel, like a lot of the froth of that guy's channel is pretty much just capturing the fish in their, in yeah. just in their moment and in their environment. And yeah. I, I think with your shirts, it's just like you're just – it's about the fish. Like, yeah. And I, I think, yeah. you know, yeah. like the first time you shoot a yellowtail, like it's amazing and, you know, seeing how they move and what they do underwater, they're just such cool creatures. I think if you don't have that and you love spearfishing, there's – Probably something wrong with you. Yeah, absolutely. And it's like when you see a dolphin, you know, the schools of dolphin fish, like when you see all their colours and and everything, it, it's like just to be immersed in those, you know, in the fish and all of that. Like if you can't appreciate that, then you're missing out on the best part of spearfishing, which is being around in, and in that environment. That's to me, that's that's what being Spiro is about is being one with with that and um yeah i love it awesome guys um there's a couple more questions left in the show um do you like joking around when you're out what um tell me about some funny stuff that's happened while you're out spearfishing oh look i think it's not really funny at the time but i think every spiro has been caught out when they've gone out really really early and they've had their coffee (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> yeah. here we go you know you, you need nature calls um and you have to when you have to go you have to go <laughs> you know i've had a few a few um experiences where i've been out there and nature's called and i've looked underneath you know and i've just seen like some huge kingfish swimming <laughs> around just enjoying um you know what's just gone down and you know <laughs> You think about spearing them, but then you're like, oh, <laughs> I'll just let that one go. <laughs> but look, we've all been there, I think. Um, yeah. It's just part of part of the Spiro lifestyle. Um, but um, I don't know. It's always a bit funny when someone else gets seasick and you're not seasick, isn't it? It's sort of you take yeah. a bit of joy in that. <laughs> Enjoy their misery. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I don't know. What about 
Oh, I mean, there's lots and lots of little incidents. A couple of sort of things that were really scary at the time and now seem really funny to me. We were diving up on the Ribbon Reef and mm. um, I speared an ice coral trout, which was instantly stolen by a big bull shark. And it got the flopper caught in the corner of its mouth. Yeah. And I was just being towed around the ocean by this thing, thinking, what the hell am I going to do here, you know? <laughs> um, and eventually the, the spear bent almost in half and it dropped out. But I just thought, here I am, water skiing, and, and I've got this amazing ski boat that's towing me around. Oh, <laughs> I yeah. just thought, this is, this is just so weird. Bull shark yeah. rodeo. That might be a shit. It for was. You. It was. I'm glad yeah. he was trying to get away from me, but um, could have could have been worse. Oh, All yeah. right. Anyway, it was. That was one thing. I mean, mm. there's there's sort of countless things. Often you're out there and you're really being serious, um, and then stupid things happen, and and it just changes the whole mood, which is probably what's really good. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. Um, I was just talking about it. Yeah. Like I think if you're going out for a day, it's great to have a good belly laugh just to be relaxed yeah. when you get in the water, you know, like the, the funniest people you go out with sometimes it just it makes it all fun, you know, because yeah. I mean, that's yeah. what we're out there for to do is have fun. Well, it's, yeah. I was, gonna, I was just going to say it's it's when they don't realise they're being funny. That's when it's yeah. really funny. <laughs> we went out the other week to the fads and one of our friends, um, Paul, his name is, and he just missed a dolly just before and then we went out to, you know, we sort of drifted again and then, he, I, I was just watching, I was driving the boat and I was keeping an eye on Dad and Paul and um, and I see him try to get under and he's trying to take this shot and he's realised he's left his weight belt on the boat. <laughs> he's just blowing up because he's just missed again. He's like, oh, my <laughs> bloody weight belt. Give me my weight belt. I was just laughing at him. But, like, you know, all these little things, there's so much gear that you have to remember when you're diving. Yeah. I've often jumped in and I've forgotten my fins or you know, there's always something that you forget, but um, it's funny when it's not you. Yeah, <laughs> when yeah, it's yeah. you, it's not so funny. I shared a mask with a bloke once. We were going spearing in New Zealand. He's a three times New Zealand champ, and we showed up at his dive spot, and then he realised he had forgot his mask. So him oh. and I sh- shared a mask <laughs> and went out diving together. Swapping. Yeah, so yeah. good. And, and that's why I always take two masks. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, have a backup. He tells it, yeah. Before, yeah. For a while, I had a yeah, and there's still a checklist. I think if people sign up on the newsletter, like I send it out. It's like because when you're starting, it's just that muscle memory of like thinking yeah, your way yeah. through. Like, what do I need? Making sure it's in the bag. Boom, I'm headed out the door. Yeah, yeah it's infinitely yeah. practical, but um, yeah, there's a lot to remember. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, all right. Um, I've got two sections to go. I would love to hear what's in your dive bag. A lot of women talk and complain about um, women's wetsuits. I understand that they are improving. What do you use, Emma, and, and do you like it? I just use um, men's wetsuits, to be honest. Okay. Um, I've got a salt salt one that oh, I've been yeah. using recently and just a Cressy. I've got a – or a Cressy. Like um, I don't have any hips, though, so I'm pretty lucky in that way. So, But I just use the men's and I find okay. them – really comfortable i have worn the women's ones before and it's yeah they're not very comfortable for me um yeah but i'm i'm lucky in that sense i don't have a woman's big bottom and i don't have hips so i'm sort of yeah i'm quite lucky nice that's good (laughs) what what about the rest of your gear um spear guns fins spear guns fins i'm not a huge fan of of flashes sometimes I do but I find I just get a bit distracted by using a flasher um but I just have a little little um thing that I just sort of use I did a bit of diving last year with Jago Crossingham in yeah, yeah. Fiji and he he just had a mirror which worked really really well um so yeah I, I keep it pretty simple just white belt fins wetsuits booties gloves shark shield and then obviously my my gun and my float. Yeah. Funny funny story. Back in the day, we interviewed Jager, and he was at you know running free dive Fiji at the time. And yeah. um, he's such a clever bloke. We interviewed him. Oh. Went for an hour and a half. It was amazing. Like I was like, yeah. this is probably the best interview we've ever done. You know, so much information. Like 
He's and a then, freak. Uh, like, and then the computer died, and we lost. The oh whole no! Oh, no. And, uh, and we had to redo it. And he gracefully agreed to do it, but um, yeah. second time around, you know, like the energy wasn't Not, the same. Yeah. Like he, he still, same. he was still awesome, but like, and that he would have, he would have felt funny about saying the exact same answers as yeah. well. So you feel phony, yeah. like you're filming yeah. a video or something for on a script. Yeah. yeah. No, he's amazing. Yeah, yeah. he's a very clever guy. Eh? Amazing yeah. guy. Where's he? Right. Where's he um, guiding out of now? Is it um, it's one of those? Called, it's one of those um, islands in Fiji. It's like a really fancy. Starts with K. Uh, Kokomo. Oh, yeah, there we go. Yeah. Kokomo. That's it. Um, yeah. So he's there doing fishing charter, charters mostly. Yeah. Um, but I know he does still. some spearfishing charters on the side as well. So. Okay. But yeah, he's good cool. to learn off. All right. And fins, any other gear you wanted to touch on? I just use the diver fins. I've got the diver blades. Dad likes the... Oh, I've got a Molchanibus oh. pair of those, which are pretty good. Um, and I use an edge or edge spear guns, uh, Tony here. Yeah, Tony. So I can give him a plug. Um, yeah, yeah, nice. And I, I really like those guns, yeah. And I dived a lot with Tony. He's a, yeah. he's a great guy, actually. He's yeah. a character. I've got to get him on the show as well. Like he's he's a very yeah, he's a character. Yeah. Can you bring the dog out with you, Marcus? Oh, panda. Oh, well, he's had a few dogs actually. I, yeah. I remember going out off um, Morton Bay, and he had a little thing that he bought over from South Africa, like a little ski. It was just flat, sea like ski. a punt made out of plywood, and I'd sit at the front in a bean bag, and he'd be at the back. And there was no freeboard, hardly at all, and the bloody dog would be there. And as soon as Tony got in the water, the dog would jump in the water too, and he'd have to try and drag it back on the boat. <laughs> it was hysterical. And we went out this one time and, and got some really nice mackerel and mangrove jacks and come back to the boat ramp and there's all these guys with their spiffy fishing gear and boats and everything and we started hauling all these fish out of the, out of the hold, and they just could not believe it. It was yeah. um, phenomenal, mind you. Tony got he got the lion's share of the fish, but yeah, no, that was that was memorable. And I've done that a few times with him. He's moved oh. further north now, so um, I haven't been catching up with him. But um, he's a, he's an amazing guy, amazing yeah. guy. Yeah. All right, last part of the show, but sort of a faster pace round of questions. I'll just. Um, Ask you both the same question. Um, single best piece of advice you've ever been given. We'll start with Emma. Oh, in regards to spearfishing? Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> um, I guess oh, single best bit of advice. That's quite a hard question, I guess. I'll put you on um, the spot. I guess to trust mum and dad was just to trust your instinct with things. If you don't feel right about something, get out. So... Yeah. Love it. Marcus, for you? Uh, probably don't point that spear at me, you bugger. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, Emma, what would be your fish of a lifetime? Fish of a lifetime um, would be, oh, I love Spanish mackerel because they're such good eating. So big, big Spanish mackerel, like 30 kilo, even though they are probably got cigatera, but <laughs> big nah, Spanish nah. Yeah, not always. Oh, I'd have to be a Dewey for me. I got I got one about thirty five kilos, and um, that's the biggest fish I've ever speared, and that's amazing. Yeah, yep. Are, are prehistoric those things. I understand why you oh, put yeah. them on this shirt, Emma. Yeah. yeah. And all right, last question. Um, could you describe what the spearfishing experience means to you in one sentence? The ability to escape. The world for Ooh, me. Oh, nice. I like it. And you did it in one sentence. No one can ever do it. Well done. <laughs> oh, look, I'd have to say the same. It's just getting out there and getting away, not having to talk to people a lot of the time. It's <laughs> um, it's great. That sort of sense of um, the solitary. Mm. Mm. Marcus, I would love to pick your brain on artificial reefs at some stage in the future, so expect to hear from me. Um yeah. I hope you don't mind. Did you see that paper that I wrote on spearfishing, the Alleman Shield? Uh, oh, uh, was that with regards back in 90, to? Back in 1989 it was. 
I think I that did see be, that. Yeah, it was sure. about competitions and then subsequent years and the impact that we have on an area. Yeah, yeah. I didn't. I didn't read it in full. I, I don't have access to uh, an academic database anymore. I uh, I can I'll, I can send you a um, PDF of it if you like. Thank you very much. I'll try yeah, and find just, that article. Just send me your email. Yeah. I'll, I'll get it done. Okay. No worries. Yeah. But um, Emma. Awesome to catch up with you both. Like, I've really enjoyed it. I knew nothing about you guys before this. You're not like big social media personalities. No, despite no. having like some amazing lives and, you know, both like in sport and in spearfishing, like you, you guys have been an absolute pleasure to chat with and I've really enjoyed it. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thanks yeah. for having us. Appreciate yeah. it. So, again, go to noobspear.com forward slash ocean rangers. I'm going to link up everything today, including um, Emma's Instagram. Uh, which is Ocean Rangers underscore apparel on Instagram. Uh, but if you go to noobspirit.com forward slash Ocean Rangers, I'll link up um, some of the research we chatted about today, as well as Emma's former life as a skeleton racer, maybe a video there so people can see how yeah. crazy that was. Yep. And um, awesome, guys. Sure. Great, great catching up with you. Thanks, Isaac. Sure. Thank appreciate you very it. Much. I'll, yeah. uh, I'll send you a t shirt. So, uh... I'll buy one. Yeah. I'm buying one. No, I'll send one. I'll send one to you. I'd be more than grateful. Ah, oh, you're a legend. Hey, legends. Hope you enjoyed listening to Emma and Marcus Lincoln Smith. Um, proper, proper frothers, as you could tell. I really enjoyed learning a bit more about Ocean Rangers apparel. Go grab yourself a shirt, uh, celebrate the spearing life, and like, yeah, you can go to Target and you can buy a t shirt for six bucks or something. and some poor person in a third world country made that for you. Or you can sometimes pay a little bit more and buy stuff from proper frothers that are trying to start things that celebrate our spearfishing lifestyle. Go to Ocean Rangers Apparel. Uh, she's got the Mulloway shirt and the Kingfish shirt. I really like the logo design too. It's just simple and awesome. So check that out, Ocean Rangers Apparel. Hey, um, guys, I mentioned it at the start of the podcast, but the Panama spearfishing Q&A call is coming up on... Uh, Wednesday the 13th of March. Go register for that at noobspero.com forward slash Panama. If you can't make the live call, then I can send you out a recording after, but it'll be all things Destination Spearfishing Panama and it'll be a video. So uh, Robert will, will walk us through some uh, a real good overview of the area and why it is such a fishy destination. So come and join us at noobspero.com forward slash Panama for that. Um, also, I did mention it at the start as well. We have started the 50-Day Spear Ready Program. It is designed to help you make the most of your spearfishing trip of a lifetime. If you are not registered and you are interested, go to noobspear.com forward slash spear ready. Uh, jump on. We're still testing it at this stage and I'm a crash test dummy. You'll be a crash test dummy, but it'll be an awesome thing to do together. We're going to have Tom and I are trying to organize weekly catch-up calls where we check in on the program, see how it's going, what sort of results we're getting and uh, just trying to stay motivated and accountable because I think that's a massive thing with trying to prepare for anything, any sort of challenge. This is a 50-day one, but um, there's some real cool videos in there from absolute legends in our sparing world, and there's a lot of wisdom uh, that people have collected over the years of, you know, if, you, if you've spent $15,000 on a spearfishing trip and you've gone there underdone, I tell you what, the next spearfishing trip you go on, these guys have these guys have got wisdom, hard-earned wisdom, so they know exactly how to do it. I've tried to capture that, and I'd love to hear your feedback on it. Go to noobspear.com forward slash spear ready. Sign up for that. Massive thanks to Emma and Marcus Lincoln-Smith. I had a real good time chatting with these guys today. I'm going to try and get Marcus on in the future. I really want to chat about artificial reefs, and I know he has done a lot of research in that area. It would be really cool to pick his brain. But for now, um, we are headed in two weeks to chat with Daniel Mann. I think this is the fourth time I've chatted with Dan. Uh, we talk about getting crepuscular while diving, driving, and spearing 12,600 kilometers on a road trip with his wife. Uh, a lot of his YouTube channel videos are from this road trip, the, the recent ones, and some of them still to come out yet. So come and join us. Dan, man, he's an absolute legend, a gentleman of the highest order, and I hope you come back for that. As usual, guys, massive thanks to the patrons putting fuel in the Noob Spirit outboard, keeping these wheels turning. Sorry for the longer outro. Uh, but again, thanks, guys. I'll see you in two weeks for Dan Man. Adreno stocks equipment for noobers. The gear you need for all things freediving and spearfishing. The Adreno spearfishing team froth 
on helping customers learn about the latest in spearfishing equipment, local diving, upcoming trips and events for Spiros of all levels of experience. There's no ego in there. You're going to meet cool people that love this spearing lifestyle as much as you do. Visit them in store in one of their huge mega stores around Australia. Chat to one of their friendly team members. Take advantage of the Noob Spiro discount code. Save $20 on every purchase over $200 in store, online, easy savings. Pump in the code Noob Spiro if you're shopping online or in store. Mention it's one of their friendly team members and save $20 over $200. That's right, use the code Noob Spiro in store. Shop with Adreno, our partner for more than $200 episodes buying gear online can be tricky you ask yourself the same questions will it arrive on time is it actually what i want how much is the shipping going to cost great news the name you can trust is neptonics neptonics solid gear that works visit neptonics buy tough gear Use the code NOOB10 to save 10%. That's right. Use the code NOOB10, N-O-O-B-10, to save 10% on your order at neptonics.com. Are you a vegan? Do you find yourself easily offended? Fuck the tax man is definitely not for you. It's tongue-in-cheek to the absolute max. This is a fishing brand unlike anything else out there made for our fishing community by Ryan, who is a legend for show just like you and me. Use the code NoobSpirit to score a free hat of your choice at noobspirit.com forward slash taxman when you spend $100 or more. Flip the lid on self-censorship and get your froth on with Fuck the Tax Man. Again, use the code NoobSpirit to score a free hat of your choice at noobspirit.com forward slash taxman when you spend $100 or more. Boom. 